Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and SoundCloud. If you are a painter or artist who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community, you will be inspired to create, and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on Join. It's that easy. This episode is sponsored by Gamblin Artist Colors. Gamblin is a color house of 25 people dedicated to oil painters. They craft materials as they ought to be, not just as they have been. Gamblin's luscious colors and contemporary mediums are true to historic working properties, yet safer and more permanent. All Gamblin products are handcrafted in small batches in Portland, Oregon. My guest today is Deborah Paris. Deborah is a landscape painter from Jacksonville, Florida. Her work has been featured in American Artist, Southwest Art, the Pastel Journal, and she was named as Artist to Watch by Southwest Art Magazine. Deborah's work has been shown at the Laguna Art Museum, the Albuquerque Museum of Arts, and the Panhandle Plains Museum, among others. In this episode, Deborah talks about her decision to leave her law practice to pursue her landscape painting a choice that she did not take lightly. At the beginning of her law career, Deborah was the only woman in a 50-person law firm, but she ended up as a partner at several firms. We talk about this tough, tough decision and its repercussions, plus how that background as a lawyer has aided her. The analytical skills she developed in her legal career helped her to problem solve and learn both the technical side of painting and the business side. Deborah and I also get into a conversation about the fundamental shift in perception when an artist really knows a place because they've spent significant time there and are in tune with that place. We talk about her painting process, how she builds a library of reference through her sketchbook, and how she uses that later on in her studio. Deborah shares her habits and rituals when she enters her workplace along with her painting process, and she also talks about the new book that she's working on. So here is Deborah Paris. Deborah, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I am excited to have you on the show, and I very much appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Well, thank you very much for having me, Andrews. I appreciate it. Can you tell me a little bit about when you started off as an artist, when you decided that you were going to make this your career? Well, my story is a little bit circular, really, and kind of a long way around. Like a lot of people you've talked to, I'm sure I started off as a child drawing and very interested in art. My mother was an artist. And my undergraduate degree is a BFA, but I did not really understand or get very much encouragement to pursue art at that point in my life. And so I had kind of gravitated over to the art history department in college. So I ended up with a BFA in art history and in studio. So when I graduated, I sort of had two options. One was to go on in art history to a graduate program. And the other one was to go to law school. Mm. Yes. (laughs) And I chose door number two. So that was something that kind of took me away from art and thinking about art and doing art for quite a while. I went to went to law school, graduated and practiced law for a good long time until I sort of got to a point where I realized that I needed to make a change. And so that was that was kind of how it all started. Wow, that's, you know, what's funny is I just talked to another artist who also studied law, and she was a criminal defense attorney for a while before having that same experience of realizing that it was not the right choice for her. (laughs) Oops, I'm in the wrong life. (laughs) (laughs) Or I have this other calling, and it's really pulling me, I need to answer that call. So was that a really tough decision for you to make when you decided to switch over? It was and it wasn't. It was very tough in the sense of actually making it happen. 
it was easy once I realized that I needed to do that. I had really not been making art for a while. And so there were just a, a combination of circumstances that happened that made me realize that I really needed to get back to making art. And once I did do that, pretty quickly, I realized that, yeah, I this is what I need to be doing in my life. And so then it was just a question of how do I make that happen? And it's complicated. I mean, I, I had a law practice. I had been, I was a partner in a firm. I had, I had this career. Yeah. And sounds like a lot of responsibilities too. I had to figure out a way to disentangle myself. And I, I kind of thought for a while that I would be able to do that slowly and kind of unwind things and start, you know, working less and making art more and that sort of thing. And I tried that for a while. And eventually, I just realized that I had to quit. I had to really just make the break and that I couldn't take any more time away from what I really wanted to do. So so that's what I did. And it was wow. it was difficult. It, it, it was difficult in the sense that there are repercussions. There, there are always consequences. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you make a big choice like that, there are consequences. And there are consequences to you and to the people around you and financial consequences, all sorts of things. And so th- there was a lot of that that had to be dealt with. How did you prepare yourself for that? Because I know from reading all the emails that I get that there's lots of people who are sort of going, I need to make this break. And I don't, you know, it's scary to to walk away from something that is, you know, built up and and more stable to for something that you're really not sure. It is scary. I I was lucky and well, in, in a number of ways, my husband was supportive of that idea. And my mother, who I think I mentioned was an artist, was very supportive of the idea. And in fact, she sort of indirectly kind of got the whole ball rolling. And so that, though I I was very lucky there, and I also had a few friends who were artists and some who weren't, who very much supported me in making that decision. But the bottom line is you're kind of on your own. You know, you have to take into account what what that really means and what it's going to mean for your life and your lifestyle and all of that. And so you kind of have to prepare yourself, you know, to have a lot less money mm-hmm. <laughs> and to be able to deal with that and and how you're going to deal with it. When I would say that I really started as a full-time artist, I really was not making any money at it at all. I was in a few small galleries. I was doing a little bit of teaching but, you know, I wasn't making a living by any means. So, mm. but I did have, because I had had experience in a profession and I had eventually actually had my own law firm, I knew that I knew how to run a business. I knew how to, you know, I knew how to make money. I knew how to do those things. And so those skills were, were good. They were very important, not only to my ability to do it, but also my confidence that I could do it. Mm, Yeah, that's a huge one. And I also knew that I would work hard. Mm -hmm. I had always worked hard and and I knew that I was going to continue to do that. And really what I was more concerned about in many ways was that I was so far behind where I wanted and needed to be in terms of my work and my ability. And I had so far to go and was starting later than I really would have wanted to. But so I had a lot of ground to make up. So it was it was a very challenging time. Yeah, I I imagine. Are there specific skills that you developed as a lawyer that were especially helpful in your transition to an artist? Well, that that's really, that's an interesting question. Because at first, I really tried to kind of keep those two things completely separate. And my husband and I have a joke about worlds colliding and it really, and he, he also had, he also had a nickname for me in those years. You know, he would call me Sybil, you know, the (laughs) The split personality. of (laughs) Exactly. And since he's basic. (laughs) I kind of bought into that for a while and, and I really didn't in my art life, I really didn't tell people that I, 
was or had been a, an attorney. And, you know, I really didn't tell while I was still practicing. I really certainly didn't talk about the fact that I was a painter. But one thing that I did realize after I did make that transition, one thing that I finally came to realize, and I'm very grateful that I did, was that there were so many things about that part of my life that were so useful to me. You know, painting in a lot of ways is is problem solving, the technical side of painting. Obviously, there's much more important side to it, but the technical side, the the, the side about learning how to paint and and getting a skill set and and learning your craft, those that that's a very it's about learning and solving problems. And so the analytical skills that I had from my legal training really, really helped me in that regard. Mm. It it really mm. was very useful to me to try to, you know, work out, well, okay, what's wrong here? You know, what what are all the different things that I could be doing wrong here? And let's run down the list of is it values, is it drawing, is it this or whatever. Right. The ability to analyze the problem and to try to come up with a solution was very useful, not only for that, not only for learning the the craft of painting, but it was also useful, obviously, in trying to build a career, trying to work out how how I was going to get that done, too. Yeah, that, that ability to sort of step back and look at things objectively without <laughs> yeah, and, and just figuring out which knobs to turn up and which knobs to turn down, for lack of a better analogy. Exactly. And and I also had been, was, and, and still am a teacher. And so I think that also helps me as a teacher, I'm able to look at a student's work and, and to help them see what it is and be very specific about the advice and the help that I give. So so it's really all across the board. It's it's a good thing. I certainly didn't always feel that way, but I do now. <laughs> <laughs> and when you weren't feeling that way, was it just like the, oh, my God, what have I done sensation? Well, it was really more just feeling like I had gone down the wrong path, you know, and, and I, I had had success in my career as a lawyer. And that was the other thing, you know, I, I wasn't failing at that. I was doing pretty well at it. And this was back in the day, but I was the only woman in a 50 person law firm at the beginning of my career and, you know, ended up having, being a partner in a couple of different firms and having my own firm. So, you know, I was having some success at it. So it's not that it wasn't going well. It's just that it was just so not what I wanted to be doing. Mm -hmm. It didn't make me happy. And it wasn't the life I was supposed to be living. So I really, at some point felt I didn't have a choice. I had, I had to change. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's very brave to do it, you know, in the first place, because I think no matter whether it's going into the arts or any other profession, when you realize that you have spent so much time and effort to build something up and then realize this really isn't making me happy. Well, and it, it, you also begin to think, well, you know, am I making another mistake? Is this, you know, am mm -hmm. I is my decision making mechanism out of whack or something? But, but to me, the desire to be an artist and to make art was so strong and so overwhelming that I really never questioned that it was the right thing to do. It was just a question of you know, how I was going to make that happen. Right, right. And it's still, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, that's a huge, I had a, I'm just thinking of a, a couple of my a friends of mine who switched careers, let's say, and they went from something that seemed very glamorous, or was very sought after career path to something that was no longer, you know, the response when somebody says, Hey, what do you do for a living? Or, you know, tell me about you. And then they, they talk about their, their second, you know, the choice that is actually making them happy, but really on paper is not very glamorous or exciting. And people just kind of go, huh? <laughs> yeah, you just don't get it. I mean, you, you, yeah, you get that kind of glazed over look, you know, <laughs> when you try to explain it to someone, but but I think ultimately you have to listen to yourself. I mean, you, you, you have to know, you just have to trust that it's the right move. And then you have to be prepared to really go after it. <laughs> yeah. And put the, put the work in and be persistent, be consistent and 
keep going even when it's on the days when it's not so fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and also, you know, you know, the path to success, if you want to call it that, is not only long, but it's it's a difficult. I mean, it's it's, it's a really, really tough. It's really hard, but it's worth it. And so you just have to you have to press on no matter what. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's one of the most, I don't know, it's, it's, you have to have so much faith in yourself as an artist and as a person, I think, to, to make it or, you know, not even just as an artist, but in, you know, I kind of feel like this kind of, this crosses over into so many other areas, but it's really easy with hindsight to look back and say, oh, yes, I made the right choices. But when you're in it and you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know the future. It's scary. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. And you have to just know and have that faith that I'm doing this for the right reasons. I am capable and you know, like all these other things and just keep moving. And and that's, that's tough, I think, for a lot of artists. Well, and you don't, the signs of success are very different than they are in a typical career. I mean, you know, you have certain signposts in a career as a lawyer, or a, I don't know, whatever, you know, stockbroker or whatever other kind of job, but as an artist, you have these little fabulous little moments in the studio where something amazing has just happened. <laughs> you know, you're very excited. Oh my God, I've just finally, I think I've finally figured out how to make this work. And it doesn't really get the same. Other people aren't quite as excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard to explain to people when you're like, I put the exact color next to the other color that made it just sing and can't, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, no. Mm -mm, no, they don't get it, but that's no. okay. You know, that's, that's totally okay. You can't, there are people in your life who get it, although they're probably, I don't know about you, but I mean, there's some people who will listen to all of that and, and be excited for me, but clearly they're not half as excited as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, what memorable responses have you had to your work for, you know, kind of following that train of thought, whether it was somebody just stopping by your studio or in a show? Have you had any responses to your work that really stand out for you? Yes, I, I can think of one one particular situation. It was it was actually a couple of years ago. I had a I had a really big solo show in 2014 that I had worked on for two years and it included, there were two venues and I did a series of very large landscapes. The largest piece was 72 by 96. And so it was a culmination of, of a really huge project that I was very, very excited about and, and very happy that I had been able to accomplish what I had set out to do. And so the night of the opening, of course, I was very nervous and, and, talking to different people. The gallery people were introducing me to people who were interested in paintings or had questions or whatever it might be. And the show was actually in two different locations. And so I had gone over to the other venue and just come back. And one of the, the gallery assistants came up and said, I, I would like for you to meet this person who, who just bought one of your paintings. And I just want to tell you in advance, she's she's very emotional. And, and I thought, OK, well, that's all right. And then her husband came up to me and said, my wife is really excited about your work. And I bought this painting for her and I'd really like for you to to speak with her. So I did. And they introduced me. Lovely, lovely woman. And she got about halfway through the first sentence and she just burst into tears. Oh, wow. So it was really very moving. I felt very gratified that she felt so strongly about the work that she responded that way. So I really, I never did know exactly what it was about that particular painting that she really couldn't tell me, but she didn't need to, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that I, if there were words for that, I don't think we, maybe we wouldn't need art. You know, there's some things that are just, that there aren't words for. And so being able to to see something and, and respond to it and have that visceral response, I think is really beautiful. It is. And, you know, one thing I, I always, I'm interested in, I love poetry, and I've always been really interested in the 
the comparison of poetry and painting, which of course goes back to classical times. But one of the things that really, really is interesting to me about both poetry and painting is this idea of expansion and compression. You know, in a poem, you can have just a very few words and and it will expand to encompass a universal idea, something that will reach and touch people in a very big way with only a few words. And I think paintings are exactly the same way. They have the ability to both compress not only what's visual about the painting, but also all of the the meaning that's embedded in the painting. And then for the viewer, that expands. That's interesting. I've never heard it put that way. And I really like that. That makes so much sense. So I think that was what was going on, you know, with this person. And she she responded the way she did because it, it touched her. It somehow had compressed and intensified something, some some sort of feeling or some sort of emblem of something that she then, you know, responded to on an emotional level. So you can't really, it doesn't get any better than that. You can't ask for more. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's such a, the human, rea- a human being human <laughs> in a nutshell, being human. Well, it's really what we're after. You know, it's really the reason we do this thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's to, you know, it's a form, at least for me, at least it's a form of communication and sharing who you are and sharing artists tend to put so much of themselves into their work. There's so much in there and maybe nobody will, probably nobody will ever know all of it, but they, you know, like that idea of compressing all of your, your skills, your experiences, your knowledge, your emotions, your, all of that into this canvas and then somebody else being able to kind of it's almost like opening Pandora's box in a way. I just have this vision from that of, of yeah. you know, looking at it opening and then it just expands out. And then they have their own experience of it, yes. which, is, which is really the most important thing because you you put something into it, but what they get from it is their own experience of it. And And so part of my job as a landscape painter, at least, is to put enough of what I want to be in the work so that when someone else, as we were just saying, opens it up, so to speak, they won't necessarily see all of the same things that I put into it or experience those things, but they'll have their own experience of it. Yeah. What I do is to create the vehicle for that to happen, or at least that's my my hope. What are you looking for when you choose a subject matter? What are the things that that excite you or interest you? Well, of course, I'm I'm a landscape painter, so it all starts with nature and my relationship to nature. I like to think about nature as something that is separate from painting. It's it's two different things. There's nature and there's art. And I certainly look for my motifs in nature, but more importantly, I'm really looking for my experience of nature. And that's one of the things that I really, that I really tried to kind of embed in my work. To do that, I tend to, I tend to gravitate towards transitional times of day, either early morning or late afternoon or evening or even, even night, dusk and night. Those, uh, those times of day for me are very evocative of certain, not only emotional states, but also kind of create a sense of mystery and where things are not totally clear and spelled out, but there's an opening for people to look into something and to see to see what they see in it. So those are the times of day that I, I tend to be the most interested in. Mm. And but in terms of in terms of the kind of landscape, I really primarily paint the landscape around where I live. I'm pretty much a freak about woods and things. <laughs> and so that's probably the biggest ongoing motif in my work. Woods, woods interiors, edges of the woods. I just can't get out of the woods, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I am so I'm because of where we, we live, I'm becoming more and more interested in that. But it's somewhat new to me, I guess, in the sense of I feel like to really 
capture a place, to really know a place, you have to be there and be there often. And it's not something that you can just kind of like traipse into and make a, you can traipse in there and make a painting, of course, but it doesn't have the same impact as when you really, really know it. So I kind of feel like even though we've been here for almost two years now, the woods are still very mysterious for me, very much a challenge and very, but very compelling. <laughs> so it's something like I play with in the, in the background, but I'm also at that stage still where, the, where it's more frustration than anything else. <laughs> well, it takes, it takes a long time. It, yeah, I do think that sustained looking and observation is really the backbone of my artistic practice. It's also one of the primary things that I teach as well. And I think you have to, or at least I do, I, I have to spend a lot of time in nature, just simply experiencing it and looking at it. I have a name for it. I call it pure seeing something that I talk to my students about and it really is based on the idea that you, for many, many years, when I first started painting again, and I was doing a lot of work, a lot of plain air work, I was actually taught, and, and it's a reasonable way to look at it, I was actually taught to go out and see the mot- see it painted, mm-hmm. to go out into nature and look at your motif and see it painted. In other words, try to make the translation from nature to paint when you're there. And that's certainly good advice, but I think it actually has to come much later in in the process. What I have to do and what what I try to do with my students is to encourage them to simply go out and be in nature and, and to spend a lot of time observing, not thinking about what they're going to paint or what they're going to draw, but simply experiencing it. And I think the same sort of thing you're talking about with your woods there the more time you spend there, the more you get to know it. And you're not really looking at it from the outside in. In other words, you're not looking at it as subject matter. Mm -hmm. You start to look at it in a completely different way. You start to be part of it. You start to uh, respond to it in a completely different way. And something very fundamental shifts in your perception at that point. And that's when you can start to think about how to paint it. Yeah, I feel like there's a point where you're looking and you're projecting yourself onto the environment, meaning you're figuring out what you would paint, maybe how you would mix the colors, what the composition might be. And then there's another point where it starts to talk back to you and tell you what needs to be done. <laughs> and it I think I feel like it takes months, if not years, in a in almost in a single location or a single environment to really start to be able to hear that. I think that's true. And I think that 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 looking part, that sustained observation part, at least for me, has to come first. I I have to get that. I have to really feel like I'm in tune for any really good work to come out of it. And so it's a a long-term process and and it it takes time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you have to be willing to... um, you know, you have to be put willing to put in that time as well as the time, which is actually art making time. And those, it's not always, it's not happening at the same time. So yeah, that's, I think you're right about that. This episode is sponsored by Gamblin Artist Colors. Gamblin's mission is to lead oil painting into the future. Gamblin has a team of 25 people dedicated to crafting materials as they ought to be, not just as they have been. Gamblin's luscious colors and contemporary mediums are true to historic working properties, yet safer and more permanent. All Gamblin products are handcrafted in small batches in Portland, Oregon. You know, oil painting has been around for about 500 years, and the founder of Gamblin, Robert Gamblin, believes that there shouldn't be any more secrets. He's dedicated Gamblin to helping artists discover, select, and master the materials that best support their work. So I am super, super excited to let you know that we have a very special podcast episode coming up. You can get connected with Robert Gamblin and the rest of the Gamblin team by joining us for this very special event. That's right. I am going to turn the microphone over to you 
and you are going to ask the questions. So if you have ever had any questions about oil painting, materials, how paints are made, anything like that, anything related to Gamblin or the Gamblin company or oil painting itself, pretty sure that Robert Gamblin and his team are going to be able to answer that for you. So here's how you get to participate. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash Gamblin. That's G-A-M-B-L-I-N. And you're going to see a little box there where you can record your message. You can record your questions for Gamblin and his team. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash Gamblin by July 10th to submit your questions and you will be included in this episode. So it will be you asking the questions this time and Robert Gamblin and his team will be answering them for us. So July 10th is the cutoff date to submit your questions. And again, you want to go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash Gamblin. I am super, super excited to hear what you guys come up with. And I'm so excited about this special episode with Gamblin Artist Colors. So one more time, because I know you're in your studio and you're looking for something to write with. It is SavvyPainter.com forward slash Gamblin. Get there by July 10th. And I cannot wait to hear from you. Do you paint on location, like plain air or in your studio or both? Or what's your process for working? Well, my process is, like I said, the first thing is I just do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And then I start to draw. Then I will go out into the landscape and I'll start to draw. And my drawings are really kind of two two kinds of drawings. Some are drawings of motifs. In other words, ideas about motifs like thumbnails, that sort of thing. And then once I've kind of begun to think about that motif and I have an idea about what it's going to be, then I start to draw things that would be useful to me in that motif. So I might do a study of a particular tree or, you know, the side of a creek with some rocks or whatever, something that that might be included in that motif. And I need more information about it. And so that takes a long time but the great thing about it is that you build up you build up many many sketchbook sketchbooks which essentially are reference material that you go back to and use you Mm -hmm. know again for for years and years while you're doing that you're you're getting all of that into your memory too and memory is a really important part of my work so when i go back to the studio i'm working based upon the material in my sketchbook, which are typically drawings, occasionally color studies, but usually not, and memory. And so I, for many years, I painted outdoors, but I've really, my process is really, I'm I'm painting indirectly now rather than directly. And so the painting work takes place in the studio and the field work is, is almost all drawing. Plus, and then there's a very large portion of memory that that goes into it as well. When you say that you're painting indirectly now, is that what you mean that you're no longer on site, that you're relying on your memory more in the studio? I'm really talking more in the technical sense, building up the painting in layers using indirect painting techniques mm, Okay, and painting directly. Yeah. So for example, I, I use a transparent underpainting and then I build the painting up in layers using Blazes and scumbles, velatures, and you know passages of transparent paint and opaque paint and translucent paint, that sort of thing. So, so the process of building the surface of the painting takes some time because you're generally allowing those layers to, not always, but very often allowing those layers to dry in between painting sessions. So, so I usually have multiple works, maybe five or six or even more, going at the same time which, you know, helps productivity when you're when you're working indirectly that way. Yeah, I would imagine. I have to ask to ask you this, because I'm not familiar with the term velatoras. What is that? Or maybe I've forgotten it from school. But then when you said that, I was like, huh, wait, I'm not sure if I know exactly what that means. Isn't it a great word? I, I like it. That word. Yeah. It's interesting, because different people, you know, these terms come from from centuries ago, but they're essentially a velator is kind of a a translucent, semi-opaque, fluid sort of a 
paint consistency, which which might go on. So it's not it's not a glaze, which is transparent. It's not uh, a stumble, which is which is semi transparent but kind of dry and mm-hmm. kind of put on that way. This is this is a more fluid paint application, which is also translucent. I like that word better than semi opaque, so that it goes on and and it, and with all of those indirect techniques, there's the possibility in some places that what's underneath will show through or parts of it will show through that sort of thing. So visually it becomes a really optically and visually it becomes an interesting surface to look at. Yeah. I imagine it's, you've got all these different layers happening and textures and exactly stuff you want to put your nose up against and look at. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the hope, you know, that's the hope <laughs> that you'll, people will want to look at it and at a distance and they'll also want to, come up to about three inches and look at it that way too. <laughs> and do you, I'm, I'm just curious because I do, you know, when I'm working in the studio, I well, currently I'm obsessed with glaciers. And so, <laughs> and so I've got these, that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got these, you know, glaciers on Instagram. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I'm looking for that texture and building things up. And for me, at least the way it's, it's so intuitive the way that I'm painting, I'm really not planning much out other than the larger shapes and, you know, like the composition and all of that. But when you're doing all of this, are you thinking like a chess player? Are you thinking like several steps ahead or are you just responding to what's happening on your canvas? Both but at different, at, at different stages at, at the beginning, you do have to, you do have to work it out a little bit in advance. The reason being, I mean, obviously you work out your, you work out your composition and all of that in advance, but the reason is that just technically glazes and scumbles do different things. Glazes darken and scumbles lighten. So for example, if you start with a transparent underpainting, which is what I do, and you know you're going to glaze over certain parts of it, then you have to, the value of that underpainting might be several steps lighter than where you know you're going to end up Mm. at the end of the process. So you have to kind of build that in a little bit. And you also know that certain parts, certain passages in the painting, you're going to want to keep more transparency there and other passages you're going to build up more opaque or translucent passages there. So you want to think about that in advance because you don't want to put some opaque paint somewhere where really you'd rather you, you want to have some nice, transparent, deep, mysterious passages that would be totally ruined if you put opaque paint anywhere near them. So you do have to think about that kind of thing in advance. But then when you get to the end of the painting, it becomes you're less worried. You're at the top layers at that point. And so you're, you're just kind of making adjustments based on what you see and what you need to do Mm -hmm. to do the best thing for the painting. So technically it's, it's, it's a challenging way to paint, but for landscape, for me anyway, and for the kind of effects and motifs that I want to paint, it's really the perfect set of techniques is really allows you to create very optically complex surfaces to create a depth and an atmosphere and kind of mystery to, to the canvas that I'm just not able to get any other way. Mm. You're making me want to paint right now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) (laughs) I think that that often happens, but I'm just sitting here thinking, Oh, (laughs) <laughs> there's no other word for it than that. Just that. Oh. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm thinking also, like I just discovered. So just sometimes there's, you discover something that probably everybody else in the world knows about, but I recently discovered marble white. Have you ever used that? I haven't. No. I haven't. <sighs> oh my God. I'm in love with it. <laughs> So it's, it's white, it's white paint, but it allows you to, it's white paint, but it's like, it's like translucent. And so you can add opaques into it and it sort of makes them translucent colors that would normally be more opaque can now be translucent. It's very Mm -hmm. strange because you think that the paint is going to react. Like if you're thinking about 
a cobalt blue or metal based paint that's that tends to be really dense. And then you mix it with marble white. It's so strange, because when you're adding the blue into the white, you feel like you know what happens when you add blue into white and how cobalt or, you know, some color will react to that. And it's, it almost looks more like a watercolor. It's so strange because you have this this dab of white paint that looks opaque and looks like any other white paint. And then you add another color to it and it starts to look really oddly like watercolor-ish. <laughs> does it knock the chroma back or does it just make it more transparent? It just makes it more transparent. It doesn't seem to be having enough, that much, you know, like as opposed to titanium white, which definitely knocks the chroma back. This maintains it. Uh-huh. It's really interesting, but it's not, it's a delicate thing. So you can't, because of that translucency, it doesn't have that power or that. It doesn't have the same strength. Yeah. 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 It's fascinating. Yeah. But you, when you were talking about that, I was just starting to think about uh, painting and, and that popped into my head. So I. That's exactly the kind of thing that, you know, using combinations of transparent and, and opaque and translucent paint can do for you i mean that, that's the beauty of it the way that the color reacts and also the way that you see it differently you know you actually see those see those colors differently too so the light reacts with them differently and that's why you get these different optical effects so yeah and it's it's really interesting too what happens when you try a new technique or you do something slightly different than your normal method of painting, for example, it just, I love that when it forces you to be precisely in that moment, and you can't really predict what's going to happen, because the normal stability, I guess, that you're used to is now gone, because you've you've changed something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is fun. Yes. Yeah. And, and definitely to have a color like cobalt be able to be used in that way. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah, for any, you know, the CAD reds or anything like that. It's just it's I've been playing with it recently. And I, you know, like I said, I just discovered it a few weeks ago. And I'm just like, Oh, my God, I got this tiny little tube. And I should have gotten like this big giant thing because it's so much fun. Can you describe sort of your, we talked about your process a little bit, but I would love to hear about your typical day in the studio. Do you have any habits or rituals that you consistently do when you go into your studio, whether it's actual painting related or not? Sure, I do. I, when I come into the studio, well, the first thing I do is I carry my cat over to the studio in a cat carrier. And so I let her out of the carrier and give her cat treats. And we have, have that little discussion. And then I make a cup of tea. And usually then I sit down at my sketchbook and, and do some drawing. That's pretty typically what I'll start out doing. It may be because I'm working on ideas for a new painting and I'm I'm just, you know, going to do some thumbnails or it may be something that I thought about the night before and I just want to get down a quick sketch of it and before I start whatever's on the easel, that kind of thing. But usually I kind of begin begin work that way. And then I will typically I will have three or four four different paintings going, sometimes five or six. And if I'm organized the night before, I will have made some notes about what needs to be done on each painting. I mean, a lot of times you'll look at something at the end of the day and say, okay, I have to fix that, or this needs to happen, or I need to glaze that down or whatever. And so I try to make notes the night before about what it was that I was thinking, you know, as I was working on that piece. And I may have put it aside because I needed for it to dry or something like that before I worked on it again. And so I'll go back and read those notes and, and then I'll pick out whichever painting. It's the first one that I want to work on and mix my palette and get to it. And is your studio in your house or do you have a separate space to work in? It's actually a separate building. It's on our property, but it's... Oh, that's right. Cause you live, you're like, you live out in the boondocks. I'm just trying to set that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. So I'm 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 lucky in that respect. I have a it's a separate building from the house. So wonderful, not, I mean wonderful. it's just a short walk up there, but yeah. So the space has my art library and it also has an area with a desk. So I do a lot of writing and so that's where I work on those kinds of projects. And then it also has my painting studio as well. Nice. 
I'm curious about how you take notes about your your artwork at the end of the day. You said when you're you're really organized, you do that. That's something that I find too, and is so insanely helpful. That was a big game changer for me. I think was like actually writing down my thoughts at the end of the day is <laughs> about what what I was what I plan to do next, or what what needs to be done, or what's working, or what what's not working. How does that work? Is that all in your sketchbook with your drawings or? It is. I have just something I call my studio sketchbook because I'm, it's in my studio as opposed to, you know, ones that I take out with me when I go outside, but it's just always there. So almost anything that I think of, I write down there. If I, I mean, I listen, like I listen to books on tape, you know, when, not books on tape, but you know, audible. Mm-hmm. So even if I hear something that makes me think about something, I'll just jot it down in the sketchbook. So everything is there, you know, the whole experience of what I've done in the studio that day. So, but really the value to me of doing this at the end of the day is that you're right. You're, you're kind of in that moment with that painting. I mean, you've just, you, you're interacting with it and you've, if you've had an insight about what you need to do to it or where you want to go with it, you know, you need to get it down. You need to make a note of it because those things are so fleeting. I mean, they can go out of your head and then, you know, it's like a week later and you're like, oh, I remember I thought of that. And for some reason I, you know, I lost it. So yeah, I try to write that stuff down. And because I have a number of paintings going at the same time, I've just done in the last five years, I've done two really big solo shows and where I was working on a lot of paintings, like many, many paintings, some really, really large. And so I had to figure out a way to organize my work better. Mm. It wasn't just four or five things in the studio. It was like huge numbers of things in the studio at the same time and all different sizes and all that kind of thing. So I really had to keep very, very good notes about where I was at the end of each day and what each painting needed. And I was on a really, I was on very tight time deadlines for photography and all kinds of stuff. So I had to make sure that I could be as efficient as I could be. So that experience really helped me just in general for getting in the habit of writing things down at the end of the day, or even during the time that I'm working on something, if I am working on it. And because of working indirectly, I can't do the thing that needs to be done right this minute because Mm -hmm. I to dry or whatever, I really try to make a note of it then so that when I come back to the studio the next day, I can be, I can get right on the thing that I felt was most important about that work. Yeah, it's so funny, because when you have those, those thoughts or those realizations, or you're or even when you're just in it with that particular painting at that moment, it seems like it would be impossible to forget something so important. But I don't I don't know about you, but within 24 hours, I'm like, I know I thought of something really Important. And I forgot it. (laughs) You forget. And, and sometimes the other thing that happens, of course, is you walk into the studio and you see something that you didn't see the day before, you know, like there's this big giant boo-boo thing right there that you have to take care of immediately because you can't believe that you didn't see it before. And so you have got to fix that. So the other thing just goes right out of your head. You don't, you're not even worried about that. You're just trying to deal with this disaster that you just notice when you walk in the door. So (laughs) if you've written it down, you know, then you can say, oh, yeah, well, I need to fix that, too. You know, so there are all all kinds of ways to get distracted when you get back into the studio. Yeah. And I find that it also sort of calms me down in a little in in some way in the sense that if I feel like I have to remember everything, then either consciously or unconsciously, it's it's like this chatter in my head for lack of a better term like there's there's like little things like don't forget to do this and don't forget to do that and oh you need to add more you know when that dries you need to do x y and z on it and when you write it all down then you don't have to worry about it you just know like okay i don't have to worry about that it's in the notebook it's fine i can focus on what i'm doing now yeah and you can yeah you really can and 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 then you can also kind of just get into it rather than trying to recall it and And the other thing is that you had asked me originally about, you know, what my typical day is or what I start with. I try to start with something that's not like the hardest darn thing in the world, Hmm. you know, to start with something that 
just gets my hand moving, just gets the brush moving, just gets stuff going that isn't doesn't require the greatest amount of finesse or mm-hmm. technical skill that I could possibly muster, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning. So I, I don't do that. I do I do the simple things first and then I kind of build up to things that I think are gonna be more challenging and more difficult. Oh, I like that. It's kind of like giving your, you know, easing into it and giving yourself time to quote unquote, wake up in the morning in a sense, like wake up into your studio time and just kind of ease into it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about what you're working on now. I'd love to hear about your current project. Well, my current project, my probably biggest current project right now is a book. Really? Yes, I have been threatening to do this for, <laughs> for, for a while. And, Thre- threatening uh, yourself or threatening your family? <laughs> everybody. I've been, you know, and, I've, and, and other people have been haranguing me about it. But anyway, I am fi- I'm actually finally writing it now. And so that's probably the biggest ongoing project that I have on my plate right now. I think I mentioned that I had done two pretty big solo shows kind of almost back to back from one was in 2014 and the other one was last year. And so I don't have a big project, big painting project that I'm working on right now. Although I I do have a couple of little ideas about maybe what I might do in the future. But right now the book is probably the biggest thing other than just my ongoing work in the studio. I'm still in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Can you talk about what the book is about? Or are you, you keeping that to yourself right now? Yes, I, I can tell you what I think it's going to be about now, but where I'm aiming, I don't know where exactly I'm going to end up. But one of the reasons why it kind of took me a while to figure it all out was that I really did not want to write another how to book. I just didn't want to do that. So I was trying to think about what was the book that I would like to read. And so this is really more of a why to book than a how. Mm. So it's, it's a lot about, you know, my philosophy of landscape painting and how to approach landscape painting. And then also some specific areas that I think are in the way that I approach it that are different than perhaps what the typical way that you might that you might read about in a in a book about landscape painting the, and by that I mean there are things that I emphasize in my own practice as well as what I teach like working from memory and also about how to train your visual memory and how to work from from memory as well as indirect painting techniques which is not something that is really very well known or talked about in in terms of landscape painting drawing very important part of my practice and how I use that and actually work from my drawings and from memory. And so that's kind of the big picture of it, but it's really, it's really not going to be a how to. So that's, that's kind of where it is right now. Nice. Well, knowing what it's not is actually just, I think as important as knowing what it is. (laughs) Well, I kind of had to start with that because there, there are a lot of ways to go after this. And I really felt like I, had something a little bit different to offer. So that's, that's what I'm working on right now. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Exciting. Congratulations. Thanks. Sounds Thank fun. You. And so I have to, I'm going to ask you this question because this is a question I get all the time, but for different reasons, obviously, but how are you fitting this into your already full, full schedule? How, how do you, how do you manage you teach classes, you have your own painting time, and you're writing a book. What does that look like in your typical week? Very busy <laughs> and always working. I mean, to be honest, I, I really do. I mean, I I do not lead a balanced life. Just let me put it that way. <laughs> I don't lead one, and I don't actually aspire to one, to be perfectly honest. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. So I spend pretty much all my time doing it. But during, I I try to work out days that are studio days and days that are, that I write. And sometimes I, you know, write for half a day and paint for the other half. That doesn't always work so well because you get going on something and you don't want to stop and go. So what I find actually works better for me is to do those things on different days 
I struggle a little bit less trying to make myself stop doing one and start the other. Mm -hmm. If I just kind of book it out on different days and it it doesn't always work. I mean, I'll say I might start the week saying, okay, I'm going to paint because I have something going in the studio and I kind of know where I'm going with it. I might say, okay, well, I'm going to paint Monday and then I'll let everything dry on Tuesday and then I'll be back in the studio on Wednesday to paint and then I'll be, you know, that would be the ideal way that something would happen. It doesn't usually happen exactly that way, but at least I try to think about it in that way. (laughs) Yeah. My classes are almost all online. And so that work is something that I typically do kind of first thing in the morning and also in the evenings, but I do a lot of writing in connection with that. So Sometimes that bleeds over into my writing time as well. That makes sense. Yeah, I I bounced around a lot in how to break up the time. And and I think for me, what finally just feels good (laughs) and it feels like I have enough time for everything. It's just, you know, Mondays are the podcast days, Tuesdays are the teaching days. And then then I have the rest of the week just to to paint and that feels that feels really good. But what you what you said reminds me. I can't remember who it was. I think it's Mishner. Mishner. There's this quote about. I'm going to find it and send it to you if you if you're not familiar with it. But it's something along the lines of. He's a writer and he enjoys his work. Oh, it's going to drive me crazy not to be able. To, I used to know it by heart, but basically, it's it's kind of like the line between work and play is blurry and he leaves it to other people to make the call, whether he's working or playing. And so, you know, the, the general gist of it was that sometimes when you enjoy your work so much, there's not really a line. Yeah. You know, like I would, I would much rather be in my studio working than anywhere else. And it doesn't feel like work to me. So maybe to externally, it might look like I'm a workaholic or I'm always working, but I don't feel that way. (laughs) Yeah, you're totally right. I'm reminded of something that my dear friend and mentor Hollis Williford said to me one time was that it's a life, not a job. Yeah. And so that's, I think, the same idea. This is my life and, and I love what I'm doing. And so I just do it as much as I can. And there's a lot to do. And I, you know, I don't want to waste a minute of it. (laughs) I agree. I agree. I think I feel so fortunate that this is something that I literally like, as soon as I wake up in the morning, I'm like, Oh, good. Okay. (laughs) Go make the coffee. It's time to go. Yeah. It's not, you know, like when I had a a quote unquote real job, I was like, Oh God, can I just sleep 15 more minutes? Can I just not get out of, you know, like any excuse to not do what, lay ahead during the day, whereas now I'm more like, let's go. Well, it's a rare, rare gift to be able to spend your life doing something that you love. And that's really it. That's the beginning and the end of it. And so it's it's not a job. It is a life. And you don't feel put upon. You feel like you're excited about it. You're okay with it. You're happy <laughs> to be doing it. Yeah. And you you get, you know, you get really cranky when people interfere with your being. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you said that, Deborah, because I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really cranky, you know? So yeah, sometimes people don't understand that, but. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we know there's other people out there like that that get, <laughs> that get it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> My friend called me a hermit the other day. I'm like, what? I'm not a hermit. What are you talking about? I'm so happy right now. <laughs> well, I think that's the other piece that's hard, you know, for people to get because this this is a life that requires a, a large amount of solitude. Mm. And it's it's probably less that way in many ways because of the internet and social media and all of that. And, and, and that's a mixed blessing, which, you know, we could have a whole nother hour conversation about, but yes, but it is, it is a life that demands a certain amount of solitude. And that's, that's where the work gets done and where the thinking about the work gets done. And you can have a lot of distractions. And so living a more solitary kind of secluded life, I think it's part of the deal. I really do. So I agree. Yeah. 
So you can't apologize for it. That's just the way it is. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. I agree on that one, too. No apologies. (laughs) Nope. This is the life I want. This is what makes me happy. And that's what I'm doing. Right. Exactly. Well, Deborah, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and get to know you. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it, Andrews. It's been it's been a lovely time to spend with you and, and I appreciate your asking me to be on the show. Thank you again, Deborah, for sharing your insights with the Savvy Painter community. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can find the show notes for this episode with examples of Deborah's landscapes, how to connect with her, and links to other artists that we mentioned at SavvyPainter.com. Savvy has two V's, so it's S-A-V-V-Y-P-A-I-N-T-E-R.com. And while you are there, make sure you don't miss an episode of the podcast, sign up for show updates, and free guides at SavvyPainter.com. So now I want to take just a few moments of gratitude to thank some very special people in the Savvy Painter community. Alchemy Works, Barbara Chantre, Bruce Garrity, Christine Rasmussen, Deb Cook Shapiro, Denise Klitzy, Elizabeth O'Malley, Elizabeth Rommel, Gabe Blingholds, Gabrielle McDermott, Greg Decker, James Lawrence, Jeanette Gray, Jasmine Elliger, Jeon Kim Studio, Karen O'Connell, Kathleen Speranza, Linda Englander, Margaret Serena, Meredith Colhart, Nancy Charpentier, Jan Castle Walker, Patricia Matranga, Phyllis Tarlow, Rebecca Balami, Rox. San Zuniga, Srivani Nara, and Right Design. Thank you so much for your support of this podcast. It means so much to me. And one last thing before I let you go, don't forget if you have any questions for Robert Gamblin or his team at Gamblin Artist Colors, head on over to SavvyPainter.com forward slash Gamblin before July 10th, 2017, and your questions will be in the special episode. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helps several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.